<laughs> Here we are. Do you, have you, so do you two, have you met before? No. This is it. This but is we will, we're meeting now. But yeah. I know her because I read all of, not all, but, uh, well, most of her great work. Thank you. So I know her. We, we feel spirited together already, all three of us. I like you already. I like you, <laughs> and I've known you and liked you for a long time. Yes. Me I liked too, you yeah. before. I've liked you both before I met you. So um, uh, the panel is, is called The Power of Storytelling. So we're going to have to deliver on that concept. Um, and the question, the question we can start with is with, with Robbie um, and, and then maybe Dor Doris. When did this thing, to, this, this feeling in you start that you were a storyteller? Do you even remember? I, I remember uh, preferring to make up stories than to play ba playing baseball for sure as a little kid and you know Pee Wee League or anything like that. Uh, I remember reading at a very young age, so I, it started kind of. I started, but I you know I think it's because um, I had a slightly lonelier childhood mm -hmm. than some people because we lived overseas and. Uh, I did. Had, my friends were books, so that's what happened with that. On to Doris. Yeah, that resonates with me. Um, well, tell does us, it with tell you? Us. Go. Well, you go. Something in this world isn't working, so it compels you into the other world. Now, that's really true. I think in my own experience, because my mother had had rheumatic fever when she was a child, mm -hmm. so it left her with a rheumatic heart. And she was pretty much of an invalid in our house and had only an eighth grade education, but she read books in every spare mm -hmm. moment she found, precisely because of what you said, mm -hmm. because she wanted to be transported to other places that she couldn't go. Um, it, that's what Emily Dickinson once said, there is no frigate like a book to take us that's, lives away. That's it. So at night she would read to me. The only thing I loved more than that was I would ask her to tell me stories of the days when she was young so I could imagine her jumping rope or jumping the stairs two at a time. I could think of her as a young girl again. So I was constantly saying, well, Mom, tell me a story about you when you were my age, not realizing how peculiar that was until I had my own three boys who never once <laughs> said to me, Mom, tell us a story about you when you were our age. But somehow I think I began to feel that storytelling could bring her back and it would stop the aging process that I was witnessing and she would feel young again and she would be young again. And it didn't work, obviously she died when I was 15, but still that love of books and storytelling really became the anchor of my life. So yeah. I think that's where it began. And when did it become a conscious project, like the thought of maybe even getting paid for it, uh, the thought of maybe even um, getting serious about this thing, that it's not just an amusement or an escape, but it could be a life? When does that start? Well, I, you know, I love the theater, and at first I thought I would be an actor, and, um, and I still occasionally do, but uh, uh, I, I found myself sort of like restless and chafing at plays. And uh, I grew up going to the theater a lot. Uh, if anybody here is, lives in or spent time in Los Angeles, the Taper is a great, the Mark Taper Forum. And, Run, when Gordon Davidson ran it in particular, it was a fantastic place to, to see plays. And um, more and more I wanted to write them, I think, rather than just be in them. And also I, I noticed that actors uh, uh, had to uh, get used to being pushed around, which I, right. knew, uh, I knew that I would get too used to being pushed around, so I avoided it. Pretty much. <laughs> I, I think what happened to me, it's funny, when you become something, like an historian, it's as if you were always meant to be it. But when you're going through that process, it doesn't happen that way. I mean, I think the reason that my storytelling got attached to history originally was I had a great teacher in high school mm -hmm. who taught history. And it's always often a teacher that can yeah. spark something. And in fact, she told stories about presidents. And she, I remember when she was telling us about Abraham Lincoln, she actually cried. 
when she told us that he died. And I thought, oh, she knew him somehow. Mm -hmm. It was pretty special that she could bring him back to life. So I dreamed of becoming a high school teacher, not a writer. Mm -hmm. and, and then I went to college. And in college, I got interested in international history and relationships, comparative governments. I studied French and Russian. I got a Fulbright to go to Paris and, and Brussels. But I had a boyfriend. <laughs> and he had graduated from Harvard the year before me. And he had gone to Berkeley Graduate School in economics. And he was willing to transfer back to Harvard to be with me. So I felt too guilty. So I did not take the Fulbright. <laughs> And as it turned out, we broke up after six months. He won a Nobel Prize, but I, I married Richard Goodwin, so it turned out <laughs> fine. <laughs> but, but the crazy thing is, when I, my graduation, Adlai Stevenson spoke, and he talked about the fact about the Civil Rights Movement. He talked about the fact that the people who would be remembered in the future may well be people who had gone to jail for their beliefs, meaning the civil rights demonstrators. And that summer, when I was at the State Department, I'd gone to the March on Washington. And I was really already beginning to think, I really want to study American politics. It was so exciting to be here in America. So when I got to graduate school, no longer French and Russian. I can neither, speak neither of them anymore. <laughs> um, but I became an American historian. And, and the reason why, of course, I became a presidential historian, which some of you know, is because I ended up working for Lyndon Johnson. And he became the first um, president that I'd ever lived with, known well. And he told me all of his stories, because he was lonely and old, and he needed to have those stories told to the next generation. He chose me to do that. And so that became my first book. And then I somehow was not only a teacher. I was a graduate. I was teaching at Harvard at that time. But I decided when I had three kids all of a sudden, my husband had had a 10-year-old when we were married. We had two kids immediately within 14 months of each other. So I suddenly had three boys. And I didn't think I could write and teach and, and be with the kids. So I thought I had to make a choice. Maybe I wouldn't feel that way now, but I did then. And my husband was really supportive that I could be a writer. I wasn't so sure. I knew I was a good teacher. And he said, just write like you talk. I talk very That's fast. That's great advice. Except that I it's talk fast and advice. I wrote very slowly. Yeah. So I was, I was telling people this morning, I, I was at one time I was at Harvard Yard and I heard these two students say, whatever happened to Doris Kearns anyway? Did she die? Because <laughs> it took me 10 years to write that first book. But why, then, why was uh, Lyndon Johnson lonely? You said he was lonely. Because he, he'd been kicked out, really, of the he, world. I mean, he had, he had withdrawn, but it was really because he had to withdraw. Yeah. And he was so sad because he knew that he had done extraordinary, he had done extraordinary things. I mean, Medicare, Medicaid, aid to education, immigration reform, voting rights, PBS, desegregating the South, I mean, aid to the cities, extraordinary, but the Vietnam War had cut it all in two. And he just needed to feel like he'd be remembered somehow. It's, I think it's that desire of all of us to mm -hmm. somehow be remembered. And, and he chose me somehow because I was there, and maybe because I was young, and maybe because I was going to be a historian, or he thought I might be, um, to tell the stories to. And so they, they became the foundation of the first book. And luckily, the book did well. So that allowed me to become a writer, because I would, I would have been a teacher and maybe a professor even, but not a writer by profession. It, it was listening to you tell these, these origin stories, I'm thinking, well, one person here, Robbie, is, is known for his fiction, and Doris for her nonfiction. Yours seems to be vocational, that you were compelled to do it right away. And Doris, you took a, you took a windy right. path. Do you? Do you feel that fiction is who you are and nonfiction is who you are? Are you different species or are you both the same or are you the same species? Um, well, I mean, I, th I think Doris is a gorgeous, beautiful salamander somewhere. <laughs> that's a good I, thing to think yeah, about. And I'm just, a, you know, a regular toad. <laughs> oh, that's ridiculous. Oh. <laughs> um, you know, uh, I think process is process. I, I, I make things up, and uh, I sometimes know where they're headed before they get there, which is a, a writer thing, and or maybe it's just a thinker thing. Um, but oddly enough, in what I do, which is mostly like write plays, and sometimes movies or TV, um, like if you're writing a play and you do too much research, you, you, you'll kill the play. Mm -hmm. It'll just be like rock'em sock'em robots uh, and auto automatons. Um, and so you have to realize that this, there's a moment where your research, especially if you're writing about a moment that really happened, uh, 
it has to be put down. And I don't think it's the same. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, the research for me is what allows you to have a detail that will make a scene come alive. And you may have to do tons of research to know what, what the weather was like that day, what the room was like. The, where, where you get frustrated as a nonfiction writer is you know your people so well, you know what they would have said to each other, but you can't say that. Mm -hmm. You can't fill that gap. You can say what somebody might have heard them say. You can have a memoir. You can have a diary. And that's when I, I, I'm so lucky that to, to think that you can do that. Because I, I say, I could do it better than these other people did it, because I know them, but you can't. <laughs> Yeah, I imagine there's j there there is a, some kind of creative longing yeah. for you wish you could use what Robbie gets, and Robbie probably wishes that he had. Give you all my research, yes. and then you wouldn't have yes. to do it. Oh, that would be fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I would love that. Uh, but I, um, yeah, I I I think I use my uh, imagination and what I to to get through the day, um, and. Uh, it it doesn't mean that I don't look at reality. I try and look closely at it and interpret it. But um, yeah, I, uh, I, uh, I I read a lot of nonfiction though because it's somehow it's much more soothing on the brain than fiction. And I read fiction at night to go to sleep because yeah. it's soothing on the brain. It's, this is so interesting, uh, wow. Yeah, well, I read fiction too for the same reason because I find I write nonfiction, so when I'm reading other nonfiction, I'm working. Right, me too. I'm working, yeah. Um, so how do, so what part does imagination play in your work? Well, I still think it, it does. I mean, empathy is one of the things that plays a role. I think you've got to try and get inside the people that you're writing about and understand why they're feeling the way they are. But imagining what they might be doing, and, and I think it works. I mean, I think it's empathy and imagination and research together. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. And how do you decide, I mean, this is a question, this is a writer question, or kind of a journalist question, but how do you decide what you are going to write about? Or do you decide, does it decide you? No, it, well, the only one that decided me was Lyndon Johnson, mm -hmm. obviously. But once that happened, then it was such an extraordinary experience to have written about somebody that I knew and spent so many hours with. And, mm -hmm. and he was a great character. I mean, he would just never stop talking. He had a pool at the ranch where we would sit with our legs dangling on the pool, and he would just talk and talk. Well, meanwhile, these little rafts go by with floating notepads on them and floating telephones in case he needed to work at any moment. We would walk around his ranch, and there would be the grave house, graveside where he would be buried. There would be the trees. This is where he was born. He'd tell me the stories. And he, I mean, I, I just think he never stopped talking. So I knew I would never have that again, right? I'd never have a live, in fact, I've had all dead presidents since mm -hmm. then. But I, I decided that I never wanted to write about somebody that I didn't fundamentally feel respect for. Right, right. They'd have their disappointments, they'd right. fail you. But why would I want to wake up in the morning with Hitler or Stalin? That's I exactly such, right. I have, I have great respect for my colleagues who've done that, but I couldn't let my day be shadowed by that. But then the hardest thing was that I chose presidents who everybody else wanted to write about because they're the most interesting ones, right. Lincoln and FDR and Teddy Roosevelt. And Everybody has written, there were 16,000 books about Lincoln when I started on it, so it was really scary. So you have to tell a story. This is where imagination comes in. This is, I didn't think about this until you said that, but you have to tell a different story. I'm not writing a straight biography from birth to death, because other people have done that. So with Link, what happened with FDR first was that I wanted to write about FDR and Eleanor to make mm -hmm. it different, and about the home front rather than the war front. Um, and it worked. I mean, the, it, it allowed me to feel that the two of them together had made something larger than one of them alone. So when I went to Lincoln, I was so scared. It was the Moby Dick of historians. Everybody wants to write about Lincoln. It was the 19th century. I hadn't really studied it. So I figured, well, it worked with Mary, with FDR and Eleanor, so I'll do Abe and Mary. I spent two years on writing a book about them, and I realized that she couldn't carry the story the way Eleanor. Eleanor was everywhere I wanted her to be. She's in the middle of everything that's happening. So luckily, I went up to Auburn, New York to give a talk. And that's where Seward, his Secretary of State, came from. Mm. And I went to the house that he had lived in, which is still preserved like it was then. And I found out he'd written a 1,000 letters to his wife because she was in Auburn while he was in Washington during the war. And they're amazing. They talk about their relationship. He talks about Lincoln. He talks about the cabinet. And letters are treasures for biographers, mm. letters and diaries. Mm. And then I found out he was important in the cabinet. And then I went to Columbus, Ohio, and there was Chase, who was the Secretary of the Treasury. He had a huge diary that he kept night after night after night. 
Then I went to St. Louis, and that's where the Attorney General came from, Bates, and he had a diary. So all of a sudden, I had these cabinet people, and they were spending more time with Lincoln even than Mary, and somehow it became team of rivals, because they had all been his rivals in the 1860 election. So that became that story. And then when I got to Teddy Roosevelt, so many books written about him, but I was interested in the friendship between Teddy and Taft because I found 400 letters between the two of them. So it's always the, the sources you can have. And so I tell young people when they're, when they're thinking if they want to be remembered by history, if you write things down, you keep a journal or a diary, even if you're not a large character, you'll be used someday. So I, I'm not a good person. I didn't do that. I started a diary when I was in high school, and my mother died, and I couldn't figure out how to meet the moment in the writing. So I put, I just stopped, and I never did it again. So I'm no, not. No diary. You don't keep a diary anymore. Or Robbie, do you keep a diary? No, I'm too scared. Yeah, uh, you know, because uh, I I think such terrible things. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, I would hate to be seen uh, for who I really am. I never understood why writers kept diaries. Virginia Woolf kept it. I never shouldn't I, they be I, writing? I, yeah, no. Yeah. I, I I very but I do write down. You know, went to the dentist today. <laughs> Ow. Like that. <laughs> that says kind of I do says that, I like little haiku things. <laughs> but I buy very expensive diaries. So they look in London. Pretty. Yeah. And uh, I start the year off with, you know, I'm going to fill them. And they just gradually, I, over the year, the, there's, there are less words. Sometimes by the end, the only word left is clay. <laughs> 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 I found one that had clay somewhere in December. <laughs> and I was like, well, what did I, why? But you know, the interesting thing is that one of the most valuable sources when I was writing about Franklin and Eleanor was something called the Usher's Diary. They kept remarkable, detailed thing. Franklin woke up at 7.20, had breakfast. Eleanor came in at 8 o'clock. She saw X, Y, Z. Um, she wrote this newspaper article. Then once I had those, I had every single one from 1940 to 45, because the book was just covering that period. Most people would use them maybe for the Pearl Harbor or some important date. But I could know if somebody saw him. I could look in the memoir to see what did they talk about. I could read the newspaper article about the meeting. Yeah. And that allowed me to get the structure. I mean, not yeah. that you're going to write every day, but you're going to re relive every day. And something happens here, and it's going to happen here. So, I, I have a question from me that's not here that just occurs to me that I want to ask. Are you always writing about yourself? N not, no. Okay. No. I, I, I mean, I think at a certain moment y you, you aren't consciously writing about a, even a part of yourself, um, but you're hopefully you know, Doris spoke about empathy before yeah I think it's the fundamental quality mm -hmm. that you use uh, especially with f fiction mm -hmm. um, even when it's in rage um, I do this thing I think I sometimes give the most morally suspect person in a play of mine the best uh, lines you uh, feeling empathy for that person Yes, because they're usually right, you know, um, to be angry about something. Uh. Um, but n no, I don't think all writing is a mirror biography. Bi I think I think at times you leap out, and uh, you know, and I, I do think you identify in in fiction. You do identify with their aches and pains. I would say specifically. Um, you know what they feel like, pretty much. Is that and really pay, what, what are aches and pain? You mean on the, the profoundest possible? Yeah. 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 And um, you know, I wrote a play called Other Desert Cities, and th there's a oh, thank you. I just, uh, and um, uh, there's a a retired politician, sort of politician, and he was a chairman of the. Uh, GOP in California, but he was a sort of old style uh, GOP guy and not one of the new kind. And I gave him a backache, uh, and Stacy Keach played him on Broadway. And the backache be ache became fundamental to the imagining of that character. Um, but it was like somatic pain from what he was seeing going on yeah. around him. Um, yeah. 
I'm surprised. I, because I, I, even in, I, I couldn't get in there if I wasn't doing something that was so important, that I felt was so urgent and therefore me, that I guess even I connect, even though I don't do what Robbie does, I do what you do. I, I feel that I'm st all me on some level. Well, I feel like I'm there. I don't know that I feel like they're me, but I feel like I'm talking to them. Mm -hmm. I remember once when I was writing about Franklin and Eleanor and their relationship, my kids heard me outside the study saying, Eleanor, just forgive him for that affair so many years ago. He loves you. <laughs> Franklin, you know that you love her and you need her. And they wonder what is going on mm -hmm. in there. So in that sense, I'm there. Yeah. yeah. But Sa Sam, having read a lot of your uh, stuff, um, I think you are there, actually. Um, you may not be, um, you may not be Robert Evans or Jack Nicholson, but you're at the table. Yeah, yeah. I feel that way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I feel that way. And I feel your your sensibility in 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 what in, in what you're doing. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank it, you. It, it's a funny thing in nonfiction. <laughs> um, um, well, let's well let's talk about process, I think it's very revealing, even if it's mundane, it's profound. Um, do, you, do you write every day, and do you write all day? Um, no, I, I think I'm, I'm always amazed at writers who write all day. You know, I really like uh, doing other things and being alive and looking around and, uh, and playing with, you know, the dog or going uh, out or just taking a nap. Uh, and I, you know, I'm, I am a, sort of a, a cheerful depressive. Hmm. <laughs> and so. <laughs> that sounds fun. It, you know, so. Half the time. Yeah, but. Half the time. Uh, yeah. at, le at least. <laughs> um, and I, I have a hard time writing if the depressive part is overactivated, mm -hmm. he, he, um, the, the, the sort of paralyzing. So I, but I, I, you know, I, I can be like activated by looking at, for instance, paintings or reading, and um, I'll write something most days, and but I, I, I don't, I don't know. I, you know, I'm 62, and I've written about 25 plays. Whoa. I mean, so somehow they're getting Somehow they're yeah. managing. Yeah. But you don't set a program for yourself. You do it when you want to do it. And then in a rush. Yeah. You're not in a rush. No, then in a rush. Oh, then in a rush. Then in a rush. Then in a rush, yeah. Then yeah. In a rush. yeah. 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 Um, but I'm different. I, I, I wake up every morning at 5.30. I have for, for a long period of time. I just love that those hours. When, before my husband died, it meant that I had two hours or so before he woke up, which meant they were completely quiet. And then he'd come down for breakfast. You'd hear him at the top of the stairs, I'm here, it's time for breakfast. And we would have breakfast together and read the newspapers. I mean, it, was, it had a real ritualistic part to yep. it. Um, and then he would go off into his study. Um, in the last years before he died, he was opening these boxes, which I'll talk to you about. Um, he had saved 300 boxes of his entire career in the 1960s. He was everywhere you wanted a person to be. He worked for JFK. Yeah. He was in the White House. He was there when JFK died, getting the eternal flame. He did all of LBJ's great yeah. civil rights speeches. He was in New Hampshire with Bobby Kennedy, I mean, with McCarthy, and then with, with Bobby when he died. And it was a time capsule of the 60s. So for the last few years of his life, I would be working on what I was doing in my study, and a good friend of ours, Deb Colby, came over to our house to start going through the boxes with him. So they'd go over to his study, which was on the other side of the room, then come back for lunch. And in the days before this, he would always be looking over what I did and give me advice on what I'd been writing. Then he'd go back to the study in the afternoon, and he would do other things, maybe read poetry or read drama, and I could work again. But then every night at 5 or 6 o'clock, we stopped, never worked after that. We, after our kids were grown, we went out to dinner every night with a gang of people in, in Concord Center who we knew. The same restaurants, some restaurant Monday night, some restaurant Thursday night, some restaurant. And then we'd come home, watch something on television, and go to bed. And so I've always been a morning person. Yeah. And the hardest thing that happened, you know, after 
So what happened anyway, it might as well since I started talking about the boxes. So I was helping him eventually after he went through them the first time. I went through them the second time with him. And we relived the 60s together, essentially. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it made him realize he'd been so sad he hadn't wanted to open the boxes, even though they slept with us for 40 years, because the 60s ended so sadly, with Bobby dead and JFK dead and Martin Luther King dead and the riots and the anti-war violence and the war itself. And so, um, but finally when he turned 80, he decided if I have any wisdom to dispense, it's now, so mm. let's go through them. And it was a great experience. It just made him feel, it gave him a sense of purpose in those last years. He was in his 80s, but he was in there every day in these boxes. He really, I was gonna help him to write a book. And then when he died, I had to figure out what to do. And I lost my routine. I moved from Concord, because I couldn't stand being in the house which we had built together with a house of books with every room filled with a different fiction in one, drama in another, poetry in another. And it was too big, so I went to Boston. And I lost the routine. And for a year, I really didn't get anything done. I was thinking, can I really do this? And then finally, somehow, I started waking up again at 5.30. I brought the same couch that I'd sat on in the other house, and the same rug, and the same chair. There was the only thing, all the furniture was too big and, and an old furniture, but I kept that. And I went back to that in my study, and I started at 5.30, and one morning I started again after a year and figured I can do that. So I've just, just almost finished it. It's coming out in April, and it's called An Unfinished Love Story, A Personal History of the 60s. Yeah. So. But routine mattered. Routine so mattered. That, that was a too. long answer to your question. No, it's a, it was a good answer. And Robbie has a new show that's out today. This very day. Right? Today is the day. Right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's amazing. I didn't know that. And that's Capote and the Swans. That's right. Um, yeah. Oh, they, they, that's oh. good. That's, that's good. <laughs> what, what, um, um, how do you feel? <laughs> um, well, I'm very proud of it because it's not, um, it's not sort of normal in any way. It's very odd and drifty and wistful, and it's sort of melancholy, and it's more of a meditation on a feud than a narrative-driven story of a feud. Um, and it's, it's, it came out right. It came out. What a great feeling. Yeah, it's really good. And I, I want to talk about adaptation as something you've both been involved in, but did you feel like you had to get these people right? I mean, did you feel that you were confined like to, to Truman or you were Babe Paley? That he, did, you, did you communicate with them in, some, in well, some way where they would say, no, that's not me, or yes, it is? <laughs> did they hold you back? Or did well, they, the, the, those are not people who shut up ever. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, save for Babe, there's always a lot of footage of everybody. Mm -hmm. Um, but Babe Paley somehow is very reserved and mm -hmm. uh, kind of absent, so you have to infer her in some way. But certainly, like you know, Truman, there's uh, it, it really is about his decline and fall. And uh, unfortunately, there's so much uh, filmed evidence of that. You know, those appearances on Cavett and Carson and Stanley Siegel, where you just see him sort of like a kind of camembert cheese melting into the yeah. chair. Uh, so there's a lot of that. Um, voice was is sort of, but that's what I do. I look, look at someone and I can figure out their voice pretty much. Doris, do you feel that um, the Lincoln, do you feel that your Lincoln was Spielberg's Lincoln? Uh, yes, I do. I mean, what happened, it was a long process. It took almost, maybe almost 10 years to make that movie because mm -hmm. he first approached me. We were at a, he had asked me and a bunch of historians to get together because he was doing a documentary on the century that had just passed. Mm -hmm. and, and I was one of the people there. He found out I was writing about Lincoln and he said he'd always wanted to make a movie about Lincoln but he had to wait until he was mature enough to be able to do it, to tackle it because he cared so much about Lincoln. So he asked me to come out to his house in Long Island. We talked about it. I was only half done. I had, I was, I was, it was 1999, and I didn't fin it wasn't out until 2005. But he decided he wanted to get it, and he got an option. But then he, it was on other movies, and he'd keep calling me from whatever movie he was on to say, what did Lincoln do today? That was his relaxation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I can so, see that. And so then he finally decided he wanted to get a scriptwriter to start. So he had two scriptwriters work on it for some years, but they never quite got 
Daniel Day-Lewis is what he wanted to be. And Daniel had said no to those first two scripts. He said, they're beautiful scripts, but they don't speak to me. Finally, he got Tony Kushner to do it. And I think I partly persuaded Tony, like I persuaded Daniel, that when you study Lincoln, you're going to feel like you're a better person for living with him, which is what I certainly felt. And Daniel Day then became my friend. I mean, he asked me immediately, as soon as Daniel said yes, he said, please take him to Springfield, because he has to see the sights right away. But we don't want people to know that he's Lincoln yet, because we're not going to announce it. He wants to have a year to become Lincoln. So I told the tour guides, you don't know who this guy is. We're just coming to look around. And, um, and, and that all worked. It, it was fine, except we went to a bar that night beforehand, and we were supposed to go with him under an assumed name. Um, but somebody immediately bought us drinks, and I thought, Stephen's going to kill me. But they didn't bring the drinks for him. They brought it for me, so it was a joke. <laughs> Only in Springfield would that happen, except that Daniel, Daniel is so unrecognizable because he comes every character, right? So this becomes part of the story. So then anyway, then um, for a year I sent him books. He only texts, he doesn't email. So I learned to text, my kids tease me because I <laughs> fell in love with him. How could you not? He's Daniel Day-Lewis and he's Abraham Lincoln at the same time. <laughs> and so we became somewhat close. And then however, when I went to the premiere, no, I mean, I'm sorry, when I went to the production in, in Richmond, he wouldn't let me see him play Lincoln because he never ever is out of character. So he couldn't say hello, Doris. He's never gonna not be anything. Even the other actors had to call him Mr. President the whole time. He never relaxed with How any annoying. of them. How um, annoying. <laughs> so crazy, right? But it's, it's he's staying in. Yeah. As soon as the last shot was taken, he said, hi, Stephen, and, and that was it. <laughs> no, he would talk to Stephen, but not even to Tony. And so anyway, so I, but I went to the production site, and Rick Carter, who won an Academy Award, he takes me into a pinball machine and factory, and it's stardust on the floor, and I think, what is this? And then he opens the door, and it's a recreation of the White House in the 1860s. It was astonishing. The rug was the rug that had been there. They had had woven specially. The wallpaper was the way it was supposed to be. There were cubby holes in the desk where Lincoln used to put little parts of his speeches. Mm -hmm. and, and the lighting was low, which is as it was. And I felt miraculously right. transported back to that. Every detail, even though nobody would necessarily know that, was there. So it was, it was great. I watched other scenes there instead of Daniel. Never saw Daniel until the premiere. So then I went to LA, I saw him there, but then in New York he said, okay, we have to go to a bar afterwards to celebrate that first bar in Springfield. <laughs> so he took me to his favorite bar, the Carlisle, and we had these favorite, favorite drinks of his called Old Cubans, quite a few of them, but it was fine, everything was great. Then he gets the first of his series of awards, and Spielberg comes to give it to him, and he tells the story of how he wanted him to do this, but he turned down two scripts, and he wrote these great letters, but he finally said yes. So Daniel got up there, and somehow, unaccountably, there was a Wall Street Journal reporter in the room, he said, I don't, I don't reject everything. When Doris Kearns Goodwin asked me to go binge drinking with her, I accepted it Good once. Good answer. Good oh, answer. I was thrilled to be yeah, in the Wall yeah, Street yeah. Journal. <laughs> but it was a great experience. I mean, when somebody, as you know well, somebody can buy your work, and they don't have to talk to That's you That's right. But Stephen let me be part of the process at every step along the way. And just to go to the Academy Awards, I felt really proud of what they'd done. And the interesting thing is this big fat book I had, originally um, Tony had written a script that was more chronological. And he loved Sam and Chase, not liked him as a person, but loved him as a character. And then it was just too big. And they finally, this is where imagination comes in. They hit upon the idea of just doing the 13th Amendment. But meanwhile, they knew the character of Lincoln. And that's what mattered to me, was that, that they got the person he was, they got the political genius he was, they got the humor person he was, they got the melancholy he had. And that's what you care about. Did they? responsibly do that. They even, I was even able to persuade Daniel and, and Stephen to tell my favorite Lincoln story. Lincoln loved to tell stories that were sometimes off color. And this one he told endlessly, and Daniel told it brilliantly. It was about the American um, revolutionary hero, Ethan Allen, who went to England after the war. And the English were having a dinner party. They decided to embarrass him by putting a huge picture of General George Washington in the only outhouse where he'd have to encounter it sooner or later. They figured he'd be pissed off at the indignity of George Washington in an outhouse. But he came out of the outhouse, and he wasn't upset at all. And they said, well, didn't you see George Washington there? Oh, yes, he said. I think it was the perfectly appropriate place. What do you mean? They said, well, there's nothing to make an Englishman shit faster than the sight of General George Washington. <laughs> it's good. And he was it's great. Good. I mean, he caught his humor. He caught his sadness. So anyway, it was a great experience. The, the, so this panel is called The Power of Storytelling. And when I, when, when I read that, I figured, well, that's for the audience, for the reader, you know. But what you just said about Lincoln making you a better person, I'm thinking this is also a power of storytelling to change the storyteller. Oh, and, I have a question. And, and so I want to know, what was it about Lincoln 
that 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 did this to you? And then I want Robbie Bates to answer the same question, not about Lincoln, but about his own his own work. I mean, if if the a, a profound time when the course of uh, of writing changed you. Yeah, I think you know what Lincoln was making everybody feel was somehow he wasn't going to allow past resentments to stay within in him. Mm -hmm. um, Stanton, who becomes his Secretary of, of Defense, um, was was humiliating to him in a law case years earlier, but he thought he would be the best person for the job. He puts him in that position. Mm -hmm. They end up being as close friends as anybody could be. He had the normal feelings of envy and anger, but he said, if you, and, and jealousy, if you let those feelings fester, they'll poison you. Well, that's so every right. time, jealousy is the worst, envy. Every time I'd feel one of those things, I just, Abe would be there, stop, stop. And, and he just had, he had all the qualities that you want in character, a good character, humility and empathy and resilience and accountability and acknowledgement of errors and ambition for something larger than self. So I did feel, I really felt like he had changed me a little bit. I don't have that kind of experience. I think what I, the process changes me. Um, you know, uh, you, you go through the process of going from uh, an idea to pages to a whole piece and then say it's being filmed, uh, the kind of uh, gargantuan effort it takes, as you know from, from Lincoln. To sudden to to turn it into something that's uh, alive and dimensional, and the process of going from nothing to a thing that's airing tonight, or the first hour of the eight. That pro that process changes you. Um, I feel I I recently realized that I had an accumulated a lot, of, a lot of work over the years. And that, I mean, this is so weirdly intimate, but that I didn't have to be like the kid anymore. Yes. Around oh, people. wow. What a great moment. Yeah. How did that, how did you, how do I get that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, you know, it's a very, it's a lot, years of, of therapy, but it's also years of, wor of working. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, um, I don't know. So you, you know you're good. Do you, do you know you're good? I'm good at, I'm good at sometimes. Yeah. I'm good at writing. I'm, I try and be a good person, but I don't know what you're asking, really. No, I mean, like, can you, when you look back and say, Wow, you know, I'm not a kid anymore. Is part of that like, oh, I've done good. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, I don't say I've done good. <laughs> I I usually I have relief that I'm not um, dead. dead. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Really. Still alive. That's, you yeah. Know. No, but also you never know whether the next thing's going to be good. I mean, that's the right. problem. No matter what, I was talking about that this morning when when Steven Spielberg showed me the first cut of his movie. He was so nervous, his wife was there and his partner, that he wouldn't stay in the room with us. He was mm, pacing outside. I would imagine. And then he finally came back in and he said, well, what did you guys think? And, and we said, we saw Lincoln alive. He was walking and talking, so he calls right. Daniel in, in Ireland at like two in the morning to say they liked it. And then we had the bottle of champagne. But that's what you want. You want a professional to never feel like you've, you've done enough now, so of course it's gonna be good. You get scared with every single one. I mean, I keep thinking now, it was fine when I was working on the book, but now there's that period between the time you, tr you turn it in, it's out there in the world, and it's going to be seen in the world in yes. April. And, and yes. then you get scared again. That's scary. It's and, inevitable. And I imagine if even maybe I would be scared, even more scared if I did what you did, which is spending all of your time working on this thing and then giving it away for someone else, to some, for, to a director, for instance, or a producer, uh, uh, to, to, to make it also theirs. You're, you're giving up a certain amount of control at a certain point, are you? I, well, I mean, I was also the EP along with Ryan Murphy who produced it, and I have a... So you had power. Okay. I, I mean, I, w I wouldn't say I had power, but I, I had, um, I, I had a, a certain degree of uh, a autonomy rather than... And, and that... Gus Van Zandt, who directed most of the episodes, and I had a great working relationship. And, you know, um, uh, 
so I was there the whole time. And the, the times I haven't been, um, it hasn't turned out so great, actually. Really great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 That doesn't happen that doesn't happen with us. Or it hasn't happened. It hasn't happened for you, has it? I'm not sure I know what you mean. Then. Well, you mean if, if you're selling other, have your other other books been made into films? Oh no, it's, it's we've actually had a really good You've luck with good, it because yeah. the first experience was my husband wrote a, um, a, a chapter in a book about his investigation of the rigged television quiz show. Some of you yeah. may remember the sixty-four thousand dollar question in twenty-one, and Robert Redford made a fabulous unbelievable. Movie out of it. And unbelievable. We went to the set. And Rob Morrow, who played Dick, came to our house for a couple of weeks to absorb my husband's characteristics. And I thought it was a really wonderful. You've been lucky. Yeah. And in fact, at the, we went to the premiere, and Redford said to Dick, my husband, what did you think of it? He said, how could I not love it? I was the moral center of the movie. Yeah. I got to say, we thought we were going to get television, but television got us. And meanwhile, I was funny, and, um, and, I, li and I was handsome. Yeah, <laughs> you know? that's a good combination. Yeah. That's a good, uh, so, but you've started now producing as, as well, well? Executive producing, like it yes. was, well, what happened is the History Channel came to Beth Lasky, my partner and me, um, with the idea that we would help them to work on, be an EP on a movie on um, a six hour documentary on George Washington. He wasn't one of my guys, so this was scary that the first film thing that we'd be doing together, I didn't know him well, mm -hmm. but I'd always wanted to write about him, but it was too late. I mean, there were too many things written about him, and ten, another 10 year project at this time of my age seemed a little crazy. So it was great to have a team to work with. I loved the process. We were involved in every step from the from the, the, the writer's board to the, there's another word for it, but anyway, the outline, the treatment, the scripts. We, we saw dailies and we, we talked to the actors and we loved it. So we formed a production company and then History Now has done um, Lincoln, uh, seven and a half hours, and Teddy Roosevelt, six hours, oh my and, God. and Franklin Roosevelt. So we've had four of them done in the last couple of years. So our little pastimes company, and we're now doing a project, an eight hour project with Kevin Costner on the West. Oh, great. Fabulous. Oh, it's been fun. I love movies. I love film. So. Well, I, I only have a few minutes left, and um, I, I guess I want to know, what do you dream about um, for, for, your, for yourself, for the future of yourself as a storyteller? Please ask Doris that first. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think really in the end, what I, I love history so much. I think it really, if I can make other people feel a love for history because mm -hmm. they've seen a film or they've read a book, um, history gives us perspective. I think it gives us solace. I think especially in the time we're living now where it's so anxious and people don't know where the country's going, to be able to go on, if I'm a public historian at times on television, to be able to talk about times that were really, really hard. Yeah. This one's hard, but they were really, really, really hard, the Civil War. I mean, no way that Lincoln thought when he got in, he could probably imagine he could get through those first three months, he later said, without going crazy. And the early days of the turn of the 20th century, when things were very much like today, the global revolution that we have today was echoed ben, then by the Industrial Revolution. There was a gap between the rich and the poor. People in the country hated people in the city. People who were old were upset with people who were young. All these new inventions, the pace of life was changing, and there was a populist movement. Um, or the early days of the Great Depression, or the early days of World War II. We thought we were in the worst of times then, and somehow this country came through. So I just, that's why I think if people can love history more, and it's being cut down in high schools, it's heartbreaking to me. It gives you that sense of lessons and perspective. We learn what worked, what didn't work. And if I've made other people, inspired them to, to like history, that's, that's what I feel. That's about. a great, that's a... Now, Robbie. Can you take this? You have a minute and eight seconds. I, I'm ready to order. It. You what? I'm ready to order. Okay, now. do it. <laughs> take it away. You know, um, <laughs> I noticed like when I started writing, I, I, I was a, you know, a poor playwright. And then my plays started getting done. And then I started drifting to Hollywood. And uh, I've noticed that I've spent a long time uh, learning how to battle the, the, the various currents in, the, in, in show business. And they are punishing and exhausting in the processes as well. And I think I would like to, uh, to spend some time just, I don't know that, that the theater, the theater's also sort of, there's so much out there to, to navigate. 
think I'd like to like write a couple of little novellas like James Salter. Yes. You know, and quietly uh, uh, live a, a quieter life and not, you know, worry about uh, picking up the phone and not worry about is the script on time and are they okay and you know there's who's in and who's out I, I don't want to do that much longer I, I'm burnt out I I want Salter for you thank you and you yes I, I was hoping you would say that oh, <laughs> I was hoping you would say that um, now we're we're I they're telling me uh, we're done, um, but but I I hope that you come up and meet Robbie and and Doris and they'll sign for you after this and have a great time at the f at the festival and thank you thank both. You. Oh, thank you.